Black revolutionaries, distillery owners, Italian fashion retailers, and Motown Grammy winners all share their best stories never before told in any other media outlets on Detroit Is Different. Visit DetroitIsDifferent.com or download the Detroit Is Different app on Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store. Detroit Is Different. You see summer is really here now. And we back in full effect. I'm White T down, and I'm actually going back to somebody that I was really rocking with back when White T's were uh, very, very much a part of, uh, I would say, maybe the uniform of the urban black male. Somebody that has a hip hop background, somebody that's heavy in business, uh, a friend of many friends, and tech savvy guy, you know. And this is the other thing that you know about most rappers. You know rappers by their rap name. It's like you never know what a rapper real name is until like you get into a situation like this. And it's like, man, don't know this person's government. But heck of an MC, heck of a producer, heck of an engineer, and also businessman. Volcano, how you feeling? I'm all good. How you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wonderful, good, man. man. Glad to be here, man. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You reached out. And like I tell most people, and if you watching this and we mutual friends, especially from any of those hip hop days, anybody that was at Murder the Mic uh, with Miss Murder. So I know people already like, Ooh. oh, here we go with hip hop. Or, or uh, the Dynasty Lounge uh, back when... Uh, Cool Beans was Renaissance Man or oh. Rensen. Uh, Rensen needs to get on here. Uh, you know, uh, did did the Cotillion Club with Mo Dirty. It's like all these hip hop names oh, have like such goodness. like rough connotations. Man, every name you know is bringing back a different memory. Exactly. Like man, too. So like for... it, it, any of these people, fire, um, fire, reach out to me. I will get you on because we have a lot of stories that go one, two, way, way, way back. Tone, tone, stretched and been on here, uh, kid, uh, man, it's so many, so many people. So as we go there in hip hop, I, that's how we met. Right. Um, I usually always start with uh, your family's Detroit story. So I definitely want to touch on that. But because we started in hip hop, let's start in hip hop. Okay. What was it about hip hop that led you into that world what what connected you and what made you want to go just beyond fan and listener but be a person to grab the mic yourself man it was really an opportunity to take and create something like have this 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 child that you can take and nurture and build up and then at the same time just keep learning it and mm -hmm. keep growing with it it got to the point to where it was certain stuff that i didn't like listening to well i'll make my own you know, it's it's. I was really a fan of of the old school Scarfaces and and the old school, um, you know, your, like your Nas, your Jays, and and those at that point. Even taking it all the way back, like early Ghetto Boys, early like uh, Ice Cube, N.W.A., early stuff. I was a big time fan of all that, and I'm like, I could do this. Mm -hmm. I can make this. I had my uncle. And I would, you know, every now and again, what I used to do was take and write, rewrite certain guys' raps. E40, uh, I think it was um, uh, Captain Save Him. Mm -hmm. I took and rewrote his verse mm -hmm. just so I can go back and spit it back just as fast as he was. Mm -hmm. Now, make that man take care of your kids. Make that man call your kids here. You know, I, like, I was doing a lot of that with certain MCs. And I'm like, you know what? I can take some of this and make my own. I was taking and writing stories and, and, I remade um oh, what was the, what was the one that was here? Um Mind playing tricks on me. Called mm. it the snow playing tricks on me. Hilarious. And we just talk about outside with shovels <laughs> and the snow is creeping up <laughs> on kid. just some just some kid stuff, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, playing mm -hmm. around. But playing and dabbling with that. Then I finally got to a point to when I got to school and I met a couple of cats that was there and they we would just walk around and we just freestyle and just freestyle and got better. And I finally got home and I talked to one of my uncles and I showed him something I wrote. And he was like, yo, I'm going to plug you in with my man. Let's go in his studio, write and produce some stuff. All right, cool. So that, like, tilted the wheels right there. Mm -hmm. Just for just for him opening that door, it's just I just became a junkie. As soon as I seen that I can take and make and create my own thing just so I can take and, like, have a message have something to say, mm -hmm. 
have you know saying show and prove that this talent is there in this building man it 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 just really all stemmed from there just to just to get to the point to say hey you know what i like what i'm making now you hear it now you check this out Mm -hmm. and just see where it lays Mm -hmm. and if if it don't lay there then i'll get better and Mm -hmm. that's uh that's that's so dynamic um and now I want to get into the regular story, but uh, for a lot of people that are watching and listening, uh, I do have uh, I don't I don't have any like Census Bureau statistics on this, but a lot of black men around our age uh, definitely uh, were freestyling, were rapping. Like if you're probably between the ages of thirty five and forty five. Yeah. You know, you you probably have had a mixtape, you know. Yeah, oh yeah. All and just like uh a lot of the cats maybe on like a dime up on us and then even kinda in our era, a lot of those guys, you know, dabbled and may 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 also owe some crack. You know, it was just that prevalent. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just like, you know, it like it You probably got mo- jumped. <laughs> you probably well, jumped somebody. Maybe. <laughs> I mean it just you know, and, and I'm not one to always talk about like certain things just like permeate and, and ripple through the culture. And I Correct. think some of that ran concurrently. Now, as I look back on what hip hop did, cause hip hop's influence definitely changed a lot of how we looked at other street things, but we're in the age range. Like if people don't know, like when we were younger, rappers were cool to us that like rap itself was a underground counterculture, even inside yes. black culture. So it was looked at like, you doing what? Like yeah. rappers were not as cool as they were today. Like rappers were looked at like, huh? Like, because you know what it was is still because it still was the battle between, and especially if you talk about uh, parents or older generations mm-hmm. or whatever, rap wasn't at that time frame really looked at as seriousness. Mm-hmm. You're playing with it. It's it's you can't make it nowhere. You can't really get anywhere with this. Well, yes, you can. And see, and now it's gotten to this point with now, with so many outlets. See, see, see. Then it was you had to be good at it, be noticed, be in front of these labels, and and put in front of them. So this way you can get noticed, or either that, or have one hit song that was worth getting noticed and worth being sold. And then you can get on. Well, now. Anybody can create a label. Anybody can create an album. Anybody can put that right in the forefront whenever. It's millions of folks that's out there that's doing the stuff on the independent level that don't even need to mess with some of these, you know, majors because they have the outlet that's right in front of their hands right now. Yeah, it's cool to have the majors, but some of them don't need it. But I also think... So that I, I, I'm just I'm just saying oh, yeah, I'm sorry yeah, not yeah, to cut yeah, you off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that to make it more of why it's more acceptable as being cool now versus the way it was accepted then. It, it's you, definitely more access, but I also think with brothers like me and you, sisters, uh, men, women, just a lot of people have their platform starts in hip hop and it's branching off. Like right. hip hop gave me like when people. I would be in class public speaking and people would be like, wow, that was phenomenal. You know, how did you do that? And I was thinking to myself like, well, have you ever walked into <laughs> like a bar of East eight mile yeah. at nine o'clock and waited till one forty-five to rap? And then, <laughs> and then you, and then you, you, you get noticed by the one person putting that together. Yeah. And now, and then they pull you to the side and they say, "Look, I'm gonna keep you in this 145 slot. You still got to show up at nine, but you got to get better." Yeah. So like when you get that, and you know you there with your girlfriend, and you there with your homeboys, and, and they, they sat waited all the night. whole night, and they sitting there, and it's like, "Damn, I got to get better." So it's like that, like some of the other lessons from people, like especially. All of the Wolfpack, like J Kid, yeah, uh, J Kid and them, Hostile, Mo Dirty, uh, they'd always like be like, "Look, you you're you're not there yet. You you need to get better." And then they drop gems, and then you move from being the guy that gets there at nine and and wait until one forty five to nine to mm-hmm. one to nine, and they to move you 11. like to the beginning, like you there, like yeah, yeah you, you yeah, at yeah. the beginning, and then you finally walk in at 10 30 
and you on the stage at 11.30. Exactly. Or whenever you be like, yo, give me the mic. Give me, yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Because you have to go through, you have to go through that and earn <laughs> that. You have to get the stripes. And, and it's, it's crazy to me because I've sat through tons of, of, of them shows, mm -hmm. waited till the end, until it finally got to the point where you're right. Yes, I walk in, hey, get me on the stage real quick. But I had to earn that. We all yeah. had to earn that. We and if you didn't, then that's why you would get there and get mad. Like yeah. nobody's repping for me. Nobody's supporting yeah. the stuff. But see, th the reason why the Detroit crowd was so hard is because you rapping in front of, of your competition. Yes. Like everybody you trying to impress is all the niggas that ain't impressed by you. <laughs> Basically. But when you get to that particular point to win. Oh wait a minute, that's impressive! Like you doing something, you yeah. got it. Then that's when they, yeah, okay, yeah. let's start pushing my man to the front. You to the side and be like, exactly. hey, hey, young dog, <laughs> right, right, my man, let's do Just something like, together. Hey, let's work. Like that's her, right? Exactly. You know it's it, so so. You got to go through and, and put in your reps, mm -hmm. and to me, I was always on the point of every song that I did, I performed, regardless of how raunchy it was. Regardless of how um, how clean or how soft it was, mm. I've got up there and did like songs that'll make you just like song cry type of stuff. Borrow your daughter, which was like a straight up love song, and dudes was calling me afterwards like you don't know how much that song means to me. Like you was up there performing, and I'm sitting here with these hardcore thugs, and they sitting there feeling sentimental about this song. Right, exactly. That's that's you learn your crowd, you learn your 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 music, you learn your craft and everything by going and being upon all the rest of these guys is gonna look at you stone face until you finally say, I'ma get y'all to move the way I want y'all to move. And when you finally give them the move, then you there. And 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 so so let's get into the classic Detroit is different. Your family, Detroit. What what led your family to come to Detroit? My fan was man, um, my pops was in Saginaw. Okay. And he was he was born out there. Then um my mother and everything, their roots would go all the way back down to Mississippi and Where then about? Cleveland, Ohio. Yazoo. Well, Yazoo Where City. Is Yazoo, Mississippi. Yazoo City is okay, you know where Jackson, Mississippi is yeah. at? I would say about an hour south. Okay. Okay. So, so that's yeah. like right on the water. Man, Yaz almost. Yazoo is 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 the hood of of, of the water. Mississippi. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, it's but it's it's nice for we I remember the first time I went there, I'm like, yo man, where are we at? Because mm -hmm. we coming from the city, we coming from Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yo, they got a jitney. What's a jitney? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what, what is what is this? They have, you know, so we were laughing. We would go down there and see some of the stuff like that because mm -hmm. it was country. It was it was country. How, how like, small of a town? Um, it was pretty small. Like your um, I would say if I want to relate it to something, you might as well as relate it to um, like a ham. No, not ham tramming. Ham tramming is a little bit bigger. I mean, uh, a little so bit smaller. smaller. Okay. I would say your uh, HP. Okay. Your Highland Park area. You know, it, it was about like that. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, you know, they migrated from there up this way. Then it was so in like Cleveland. One of those, uh, like a city so small that people actually like put on a suit to go to the movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that was that was a thing back in the day. Everybody, like the, yeah, people was, go see Spider Man and, and put on a put on a three piece. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we going out today, baby. Where are we going to the movies? <laughs> put on your best gear, boo. No, nah, but it's it's they migrated up this way and came uh, up, you know, through Cleveland, Cleveland. and uh. Yes. Okay, now um, I got fam in Cleveland. Whereabouts? That part, I you're not I, yeah, because basically they bounced through Cleveland and said we exactly. gotta get to the D. It's more now there, there was part that was in Cleveland, Lima, Ohio. Ah, we know Lima too. Lima, Ohio. So mm -hmm. okay, Lima, Ohio. Okay, is your northern version of Yazoo City, Mississippi? Okay, <laughs> all right. So <laughs> there's there's those are two areas. Just like yeah. to me, Detroit and Oakland, California. 
Same. Yeah, yeah, we're we're the, very similar. That's if that's the multiverse. Mm-hmm. They, you know they, what I'm saying? Yeah, baby D may be watching this in yeah. some universe, and I always I always get on them <laughs> about the funk artists in Detroit are way better than the Oak. I just oh yeah, they are. <laughs> they are. They are. They definitely are. You know, matter of fact, the funk artists from Detroit taught the funk artists from the Oak. Oakland, yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Did. yeah so the funk so funk artists from Dayton just took it to it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. He said Dayton. So yeah, it's it's by way by way of those areas. So. Ended up here in Detroit, and I mean, it was my father, my mother's folks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some low boys mm-hmm. that everybody knew, and it was five of them, I believe. If I'm getting the number right, but all five. of them, yeah. So your, so your mother had five brothers? Or no, 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 not father. five brothers. I'm saying my mother's father. Your mother's yeah. father. Yeah. So which all migrated okay. up here, and they was like. The cool thing about that side of the family, they owned plantations down in the south. Mm-hmm. You know so what I'm saying? So they had some money to head e- up north. Exa- exactly. Mm-hmm. So we got to particular points where my mother and father stayed up the street from each other. What type of, uh, what were they farming and uh, what, did, what did your family farm? It was some cotton. Uh, mm, okay. Yes. Mm. So they had, um, but, you know, there was other there was other not just the textiles and everything that they was doing but they had other plants and and but they had their own plantations and everything that they owned back okay. in the family line but you know now nah, you know i love this black history stuff so yes. basically after reconstruction your family was one of those families that um and, and this is one of those unique things about you know american history Correct. because every everybody's angle of any form of history revisionist past yes. can be from their angle but <clears throat> some of the narratives that are written often about the struggles and traumas connected to uh economic and financial suppression kind of gloss over that time during reconstruction where there were so many craftsmen and craftswomen that knew the land yes that knew skills and it makes sense because they weren't doing any it was it was people that were labeled as enslaved yes that that knew all the crafts so in in short stints of time through reconstruction it was it was a lot of black families across america making large leaps exactly which led to so you all understand the context of why jim crow laws had to be existent in in a lot of those grandfather clauses of course because black people were like you know people talk about black wall street black wall street was not an anomaly no it was it was prevalent in many places yeah like families like now i'm hearing your family is one of those families correct and it 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 happened in so it's almost like the the one that the media got a hold of because it was able to display that the the way it happened it was tragic Mm -hmm. it was something that was large and tragic that happened to tulsa so of course you hear about you know black wall street but there was a lot of other areas Yes. Maybe not as um I want to say maybe not as black populated mm-hmm. but still had, you know, the abilities for black owners to do some of the things that they actually did and, and, and grow what they did. And influence the hell out of markets. So like uh I, I press an urge of a lot of people it it can be frustrating for a lot of black people, but even when you read uh Up from Slavery, uh the autobiography from Booker T. Washington, he gotcha. speaks on this like the role of Tuskegee and even public schools in themselves, you know, public schools in, in America were really a project led through Andrew Carnegie and a lot of the other, as they call them, like uh, wealth barons of the day. Correct. Because at, at the turn of the you had you had a broken, still divided into this day. At really, the ba- nation was divided upon foundation. Like, of course. That whole three-fifths compromise was not anything the people from the South really agreed with. The people from the North really didn't agree with it. Correct. It took the Civil War to contentiously bring that together, and we still see as, you know, what we just saw. Like, I, I mean, we're recording a day after uh, the, the mass murder in Buffalo. Yes. Uh, we see January 6th. We see just a lot of stuff. Like I didn't get shows. to dig into that buffer to, to what happened. I seen mm. like a quick little glimpse of like, yo, what happened? Okay, let me let me. I was in the middle of some other stuff yeah. at the time, so I didn't get really to dig into that. January sixth, another but thing. So so much like it's been a contentious relationship, but 
we as a people, black people, we were so talented. Even the, the staunchest KKK member had to rely on some of these, some of the, some of the ingenuity, creativity of a lot of the black people, because without it, especially in those Southern towns, how would you be able to process no. anything? No. Hence, it moved a lot of black people in positions due to their same racism that excluded black people from getting anything. Exactly. Leaps and bounds. Well, see, you saw what you saw was the ingenuity and the intelligence and the engineering that came from mm -hmm. all the way back in Africa. We're finally getting his chances to resurface yeah. and, and, and hit these points to where you see the potential behind a people that, yeah, you held back or you kept down for a specific reason because you knew. If you if if really it came down to it, if we had the opportunity to really organize and do the stuff that we're supposed to do, we can be very, very dangerous. And, and, and reconstruction, maybe in that short period of about 50 years, you had so you had black Congress, black Congress men, because, yes. you know, racism, I mean, sexism at the time you had. So but a lot of women that were massive owners as well and like yes. a wealth base because like we say like we knew like it'd be like if you if we knew because as being even though that was a heck of an industry being a, an enslaver you lack so many other skills correct of, of understanding anything especially that can travel and export to the world correct it was the enslaved that were more skilled yes so this this empowered people to the point where like i say that project of public schools was really something that andrew carnegie you had to shift this nation that they said was an agricultural nation but this wasn't an agricultural nation no it was black people exactly. that were agriculturalist and now you have all these white people that are basically like what do we do and and hence tuskegee and it's like we need public schools because we got to teach them to become industrial workers correct that is why a lot of like when people talk about like, man, public schools are failing and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, the inception of the of why public schools exist, they can say whatever they want to say. Correct. But the reason public schools exist was to shift this populace of so many masses of white people that had no skills <laughs> to be at some level yeah. to be productive in society yes. and not sit around and look at the black guy that knows how to be like, all right, yeah, we, we can take this cotton, turn it into textile. Correct. We can make, we can, uh, oh, they, they into making plastics now. Correct. We can figure out some ways to make plastics. You know, uh, some of the hemp designs of, of, of George Washington Carver and t tip my hat to George Washington Carver but For he was getting game. Was but he was getting game from other people, Good. straight from plantations. Yes, you know what I'm saying. So it's like and these people can't the quote unquote read and write, but they knew how to like. Oh, you can look at this and use this for that, this for that. You can make this from that, this from that. The because whole, yeah. because we we are the type of people that like to or can try to find ways to make stuff as easy as possible or easier. Like, I know I got to do this on a day-to-day -day basis, but guess what? If I had this, I would do this, and therefore you have your creation of that. Oh, man, you got this this uh, self-lubricating can or, or you know, you got all these different the traffic light. You got light bulbs. You got telephone. All the rest of these things Air that we come up with. Refrigerator. Like, hey, it's hot in here. If yeah. I had something, man, if I had something blowing the ice, oh, wait a minute. And it develops and it develops and it develops. Mm -hmm. And then you have some of these folks that take it. And it's like, oh, if you want to take that? Well, let me let me steal that idea. Put a little bit of money behind it, and bam! Now nah, I'm put my name on it. Jack Daniels versus Uncle Nearest, you know. <laughs> and I mean, they were they were next to each other, but Jack Daniels family. I mean, I'm sure most of you all are familiar with this. Got into uh, distilling because of the recipes and all of the know how and ingenuity of Uncle Nearest. Yes. Because Uncle Nearest had a reason. We were agriculturalists, and now as as we get into this, I guess urban gardening movement is unique thing <laughs> that that's happening but this urban gardening movement is reconnecting so many of us back to something that we that's just so natural as you talk about just being back in africa just closer to our roots yes it's of what course. we do of course you know the industrial age and in, in in i shouldn't even say that but more so because really when you think of the foundation of the biggest leap in the industrial age was henry ford hence henry yes. ford but henry ford's whole design 
of how he developed everything came from the mind of George Washington Carver, exactly. which came from the mind of, like I say, a lot of those people that were enslaved. If you read most memoirs, and we know Henry, Far Henry, Henry Ford's uh, predisposition of supporting Nazism, uh, connected to um, connecting to connecting to some some things that are ill and, and, and inept there. Yeah. Uh, and, and and I'm definitely not characterizing a man of his time or his day, but but with it, Henry Ford was one that definitely exalted the hell out of George Washington Carver. Yeah. And lent his ear all the time like in his my life my workbook is so is so many references to things that just are the same drawings from george washington carver yes just that relationship was so symbiotic which basically was a big leap into the industrial age so that's still a blueprint that connects back to black people that i'm sure like i say george washington carver didn't get all of this from osmosis he was getting that game from a lot of the other people so what 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 i hope people would understand and and I've been told this and showed this also that we here as black Americans um, mm -hmm. and even back to that particular time frame was you might as well you might as well say genetically modified and built. And I, I'm not saying that, you know, somebody sat with a Petri dish and doing this, but you got to look at when the ships landed there in Africa, picked up who they picked up and brought them around. They made multiple stops before they got here. Yeah. Some people didn't make the trip. Yeah. So they, wh whoever jumped off or was thrown off before yeah. they got to places like the Caribbean or Brazil or the Brazil areas was, like there, yeah, yeah. some people got off there. Then they made another stop. Some people got off there. By the time they got to the point to where they hit the Americas, you have pretty much like the cream of the crop. The best of the best, the ones that can actually make the trip, the ones that can actually get out here and do the most. So they probably were smarter, they probably were stronger, and they probably was a whole lot more adept to being, you know, in some of these positions that they were in. Mm -hmm. Using that and actually creating this, I mean, you, you got to even look at the ones that were chosen and allowed to breed. Or the ones that were chosen and allowed to have kids. or I mean, you the, know, the breeding process was so horrific, the way that they would beat yes then rape a woman yes then wake up and then beat her again then rape her again like yes the it's the, the 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 horrors of what black women went through yes. through the enslavement process middle passage and, and then even even the quote-unquote of, of purchasing a enslaved woman yes. and then even the rape of men as well and it's like it was a horrific process yes. of like basically we're going to we're going to break and impose our will upon you in a way that makes you so fearful yes where now you are we've stripped you of so much of your dignity your humanity who you are like it was imp it, it was superimposed on women. yes it, it was and as horrible as it is look what it built look yeah. what it created look what it started to, to come from it it found its way to actually regurgitate some of the actual, you know, creative thinking and creative ways and everything of our people to one overcome and deal with the situation that we're actually were in. Like I gotta, if I if I feel like I gotta survive, I gotta survive through this. Man, I mean, what do I? What else do I gotta cope with? I, this is this is the toughest thing. This is COVID. You know what I'm saying? Like full fledged injected into my system that I gotta live through. You find ways to get creative. You find ways to get smarter. You find ways to get stronger. And some people did that. And those same ideas was all taken, was all stolen, all used. They didn't get the credit for it. They didn't get, you know, they some of them did. Somebody sat down and decided, like, you know, we gotta make sure that these people get the credit for it. But some didn't. There's a lot of stuff that you that you're just finding out now that this person actually made this. Yeah. Like this person actually created this, and you would you would mm -hmm. never even know if somebody had to had to, hadn't have decided to go ahead and unearth that information the way it's supposed to, and actually finally tell the truth. Yeah, I mean, so it's we've we've come through a lot, we've seen a lot, and we've built um, ourselves up in ways that we can actually one recreate and make and be as creative as we actually are, and then send that down to our kids, and they've tried to break that system. 
on so many occasions. So that's why they put us into the plants. Like, okay, you're only allowed to get here. You're only allowed to get to this point. You're only allowed to get to this particular point. I mean, it's 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 so many it's so many different caveats. It's so many different like ways and things that we've been treated. I try to see stuff like on a broader aspect. I have an opportunity to do this. I'm going to take it and make it my business to get everything that I can from it. And I don't care who's in the way. I don't care who's there. I don't care what color you are. I'm going to be able to show you that I can succeed in this and let's get it. All right. So you speak of creativity and us getting that ingenuity. And I mean, we definitely did a big deep dive into like, some of our perspectives on the background of how race impacts certain things, yes. especially like when you were talking about some of the opportunities that you have, uh, as we always say, like this tree kind of grows out like your family itself, um, coming to Detroit, that call to action. What was that call to action bringing your family here? You know what? I, I'm not going to say, uh, outside of the time frame and, and, what jobs and everything was available and moving north and everything some more opportunities all this stuff was opening up up here so that's the only thing i could really pointed it pointed to and place it on outside of um just like typical families you want to put your family in the most you know economic situation you want to put it in a better situation probably want to get away from whatever you know yeah. especially in that time frame whatever's yeah. going on racially in the south mm-hmm. okay let's get to somewhere better else where we know we can actually survive so whatever whatever the um quote unquote backstory was as far as like oh i gotta get up get the family out of here because of this can't really say but i know there was a huge migration that came north and you know so well, I, i've seen people joke like yeah people got on the train and headed up to detroit and yeah. the ones that did, wasn't able to read the signs ended up in chicago hilarious that's funny <laughs> that's funny that is a very funny thing um with with that being said uh neighborhood what neighborhood did your did your family move to oh east seven mile mound um Actually, and it started off probably, actually, no, actually before that, I take it back. And it's funny that we talk about this because I was just talking with Miles about this like yesterday. So Grand Boulevard area, that's that was the stomping ground. Like East Grand Grand Grand? Boulevard, East Grand Boulevard, right over like Mont Elliott, mm. that whole area in that sector, that okay. was the stomping ground. So that's, that's like... Uh, that's like Miller High School, or well, Miller Junior. For right, you, right, right, right. Miller High for a lot of other people. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like that area. I think actually, I think my mom's went went there. May have we was talking about that same school, and that was the that's the primary area where a lot of the brothers and everything of my of my parents oh, kind of se- settled. So and they they were like, because uh, I mean, you, you know, you talk about that Black Bottom area. Yes. So that's like adjacent, like you know in that same zone like Correct. you know so like a real close to the center where most black folks was yeah. was where your family moved palmer palmer mm-hmm. street uh let's say right off of mount Elliot. we was talking about a bunch of these just yesterday i i am not playing mm-hmm. and so from there it, it migrated they jumped around and moved around but, but you know most of the east. family most of the yeah pretty much stayed east Outside for a small stint that my parents did on the west over on Petoskey. Some but people um, looked at them like, why are you going to the west side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's 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 where they had to go. But ended up all back east. Like all of my family mm-hmm. stayed all around in the same area, one little pocketed area. Mm-hmm. So yeah, one side of Seven Mile was was my parents, the other side of the Seven Mile was, you know, their parents. We literally stayed like around the block from mm-hmm. each other. So we was always back and forth over to my grandparents and and my father's parents and my mother's mm. parents all stayed on the same street, like mm. right up the street from each other. So wow. I would go over there, see one, and we'll walk right up the street, see the other. Mm. We was was constantly around, play basketball over there, all kind of mm. other stuff. You couldn't but, get in no trouble on that street. Oh no, not whatsoever. <laughs> whatsoever. And every it was one of those things where everybody knew everybody, and that was a good thing because it was a good community. We knew this family. We knew and always by the last name. Mm. That that was them. That was us. We 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 all settled right there, and even on my side of the street to my little pocket neighborhood, everybody knew everybody. 
Everybody dealt with everybody. You couldn't get in. I couldn't get in trouble nowhere. Yeah, no, <laughs> you like, see what I'm saying? Because like if you skip I, school, it's like oh, everybody man. knows. <laughs> like the whole area knows. Like they're, they're gonna cr- so. Um, but yeah, ended up moving, staying east side. Mm-hmm. I've seen it. I've seen it change. I've seen it flip. I've seen it. man. Listen, I miss Dodnettis. Let me tell you that much. Ah, so Dodnettis so. Shrimp. So Dodnettis, we that was that whole little area. Seven Mile a Mile was mm-hmm. Dodnettis, and um, it was a bunch of other little Skinner's ice cream that was over there. It was yeah. a bunch of these little small shops and everything, like you, right you along probably, Seven Mile. You know there. Uh, what you call it, and you probably may know that uh, R.J. Watkins and Henry Tyler they had an arcade over there for a minute. I believe so. I've heard of it. I've heard yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. There used to be a record store that was up that way also. It was like it mm-hmm. was it was literally like a midi area. It's like a little mini downtown. Mm-hmm. Right there on Seven Mile. Yeah. Between that between the area. Now I'm almost similar to what you saw, like Seven Mile and Woodward. You see mm-hmm. the whole little Arabic area that mm-hmm. was over there. Almost similar to that, but you know, a little smaller area right there on Seven little, Mile. As we call it, little Baghdad. That's, <laughs> that's not uh that is not the Dearborn uh collection no, of our, no, no, of, no. Our, of our Arab brethren. <laughs> so so that was that was the area that we was at, but I've I've mm-hmm. seen so many places come and go, like barbershops and shops and stores, mm-hmm. all black. And yeah. like good, like at what they did. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And we knew them even from the neighborhood, you know, like BBs. Yeah. That was my man's I grew up with. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? All all that right in the area. Uh the folks that ran dot net is all right in that area. Skinners stayed right behind us. You know, all these all these people that own these places stayed in the neighborhood and helped to build it up. And and again, like I said, it was good at their craft, but you see some of the buildings go, some yeah. other places come up. You know, and you you see it time to kind of take the direction it takes. So for you, high school, where did you go? Notre Dame High School. Okay. Which what is was that which, like? Which is um, I want to I want to say this. Coming up through school, it was always mixed. I was around black. I was around white. Mm-hmm. I was around you know many different races all over. When I got to Notre Dame, culture shock. Because mm-hmm. I was one of few yeah, black faces in the midst of that, but my brother went there, mm-hmm. and I had this thing, you know, saying a lot of stuff that my brother did. Okay, I'm gonna follow suit. He's seven years older than me. I'll follow suit with a bunch of stuff he went. He went there. I know I can pull it off also. So I went there. What and was yeah. it? What was it like? Because uh, definitely being in a Catholic institution is being black, and 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 it's a it's a history of 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 black people that have left strong impacts on our community that come from that system and and that system of education like ties to parish systems and order structure like it's it's layers in understanding i think navigating america so you can understand that institution this i've been private school all my life Mm -hmm. and this is like super saiyan private school okay Mm -hmm. um all male uh, next door to an all girls high school, predominantly white, mm-hmm. and I was probably one of in my graduating class. I was one of three. When wow. I first got there, I was one of six. Wow! Then my freshman year, one of six black kids. Mm-hmm. So the way it was taught, our schedules rotated. It wasn't just first hour, second hour, third hour, all the way on up. Monday was first two, one, two, three, four, straight on through. The next day was one, three, four, and it switched. It rotated every day. So you had to stay on top of your toes as far as for what class I have when and on what days. You know what I'm saying? Your first and lunch stayed the same. Everything else rotated. Mm -hmm. We had specific words that we had to know for that week. Every week the word changed, and we had to find ways to incorporate that word. Mm-hmm. But seeing some of the backgrounds and some of the levels of which that they taught and some of the information that they actually gave was uh, kind of unreal. Um, I've actually seen a Catholic priest tell me that Jesus was black. Hmm. Okay. Well, not necessarily black, but not fair skin. Put it, mm-hmm. put it to that. Put it to that thing. They kept it 100% real with you. 
we had stuff as far as current issues and current events and things that we learned about, but the level of which the accountability that you was held to was very, very strong. You gonna learn this and, or you gotta go. If you're not here by certain times, we call in your house. And you gotta look at, this is back in, I graduated in 97. Mm -hmm. So this is back in like 90s era. Some folks didn't really care about it. Like some other schools was like, yeah, call your house. For what? You you ain't here, but we got you on paper that you know supposed to be here. But these people, they hunted you down. They looked for you. Where you at? You not here. They they made you accountable for all the things that you were supposed to do. They made your parents accountable for all the stuff that you were supposed to do. They made sure that they communicated. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen in a lot of other schools, but um, the level at which it was kind of drilled into you, and especially being an all male environment, you ain't had no choice but to learn it. So, how how did you respond? Like, cause I know your homeboys, cause you still seven and mile. Like, how was your homeboys responding to? First off, you wearing a uniform at the time, and like, did you? When did you start noticing the difference? That like, I'm going through a different experience, cause I guess that neighborhood would have been like the Persian neighborhood. So it it was. Per, we sat between Persian, yeah, it was, it was closer Persian and Osborne. Yep. Um, well, it wasn't uniform. It was, well, in some way, shape, or form, it was dress code, not uniform. Okay. So okay. we had to wear, uh, couldn't be jeans, pants mm -hmm. had to have a crease, shirt mm -hmm. had to have a collar. Okay. Pretty much almost like what I got on right now. So yeah. for these, could, these had to be like a khaki or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I never really, I found a good way to how to not intermix that world with home world. I found a good mm -hmm. way to, um, when I came home, I didn't bring that home with me. When I went there, I didn't bring home with me there either. So because of the fact of you have to play, it was it was almost like a military type of thing. You got to find a way to actually like separate the two. So this way, nobody's going to look at you funny. Yeah, I was learning a lot more, but I never really found it my responsibility to, you know, um, push what I was learning on other people at that time. Um, and I, at the same time, I was never really trying to bring that hood mentality into the school where I know it's not going to survive. They're going to weed it out. They're going to pick it out. So it's, it's, it was a culture shock. Definitely. When I first got in there, I'm looking like, okay, what is this? But again, I've been in private school all my life. I've had, I've been in, even though I've been in private school, I was still in predominantly black private schools. Mm -hmm. But the level of morale came from, um, we're going to teach you about religion the entire time. That was my parents' whole goal. Regardless of what school you go to, you're going to learn about religion. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn about, you know, spirituality in that in that shape or form. Not quote-unquote religion, but spirituality. Because we're non-denominational. Mm -hmm. So, again, I'm non-denominational from the hood in an all-white Catholic school. Boy school, too. All that. male. Mm -hmm. Ain't no, ain't no, ain't nothing to look at. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it really takes you to a whole different place. And it's, it's almost like you form a brotherhood with these guys that was actually there, like a military. And, and, and that's the other thing, like, when I think about certain strides I've made in life, uh, especially now as I look at, you know, I'm president of Northwestern 2001 uh, right. alumni. Uh, I'm the president of Northwest Detroit Northwestern's alumni. Right. I was not the class president. Elena, shout out Elena. <laughs> but, uh, but I do, you know, in other travels, I look at, uh, especially like my homeboys that went to Cass or Renaissance, it's, it's a different social circle. So I can only imagine the type of social circle of your graduating class now 20, 30, you, you know, 20, 25 years later, you know. You know what's funny? Some of the things that they're just doing, even if you just look at them on LinkedIn, maybe not to just pull up and be friends, but just where they're traveling. You know what's funny? After after I left Notre Dame, I went to Ferris. I have more acquaintances from high school mm -hmm. that I'm 
that I consistently kick it with and talk with and are in cahoots with from there than I am from any other school wow. that I've been to. Ain't that something? Yeah, that is. And what's funny is I had to, um, again, like I said, it was more of a brotherhood there because we had to hold each other back. This is where you play sports. This is where you, you know, I mean, organized sports and organized learning and everything. Um, my friends from there don't always hang with my friends outside of there. And it's not even like I bring them around. It's not, and it's not even intentional that these people aren't, you know, it's the intermingling cultural, like it's, that. It's it, the cultural, um, like, even if you do the same stuff, it's like, I love boxing. So it's homies I watch boxing with. Yes. Though I know it's other people I know that would appreciate a boxing match. Yes, but it doesn't but click like to you to... The, the, the what, what my dad always says, it the, the dynamics of the relationship yes. don't call for like, hey, client that I know you like boxing, why don't you come over here and hang it's, out with me exactly. and my homies from way back as we watch the Benavidez fight. Exactly. You know? Exactly. It, it's it's like that. It's so... Yeah. Some, of, some of the homies... Then been to my house. Yeah. The ones, the homies from the school, they don't know where I stay. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, and it's not even intentional. It just kind of happens. Culturally, it connects it, like that. It just, right, exactly. I'm the inroads yeah. in between the two, but it doesn't mean that they got to walk down it. Mm -hmm. um, but Kind of like our relationship is through hip hop. Yes. Like, you know, like I said, it's like hip hop is a weird fraternity almost. It's, like So like, you would never think to yourself, you almost got to be real tight to think like, hey, I'm going to invite um, these rappers that I've been knowing my whole life to come to my wedding. And you'd be like, huh, what? <laughs> you know what I'm right, saying? Exactly. Like, though you may, you know, at, at, at one point in time, we were seeing each other maybe three, four times a week. A week, just because of being out bouncing yeah, around from the spot same to spot. spaces, yeah. So, so and, and you're right, that is, a, it's, it's the same thing. You you have these different uh, forms of, of of people that you run into, or these different networks yeah. that you every now and then plug into. Each one of them feeds a specific need that you may have. Like you know what, I want to go on stage and get my rocks off, and my man's is here, my man's here. Oh man, it's like a reunion in this boy. Everybody's fam because we know that we know what we done went through to get to this particular point to be on that same stage with each other. Yeah. Same thing there. Mm -hmm. Same thing with your homies and everything that you grew up with. So it's not like it's intentionally separated. It just happens to be that way because these folks don't have the same interests as these folks. And these folks don't have that same interest as those folks. So it just so happens to land that way. Now, if I put on a big, huge show and I bring out the homies and I bring out them homies and I bring out the other rappers and everything. Yeah, it's it's then, a place and space where everybody can intermingle. Exactly. But it not, and, and it's not still not going to guarantee yeah, yeah, that yeah. they're going to intermix. Gonna, yeah, yes, yes. You know what I'm saying? They, they still going to go off and do their own thing, even though they're there to rep for me. Mm -hmm. They still gonna go and do their own thing, and It'll I can be in their comfort zones of where they're at. Exactly. Exactly. So, so you you mentioned Ferris after, uh, after Notre Dame, right? So during this whole time, you mentioned at a young age just writing and stuff. Are you rhyming this whole time and like getting more into music, or are you still kind of looking at it as like a hobby? I started writing just for play back in like seventh, eighth grade. Okay. That's when I actually just playing around. I had a class that um, the teacher asked for us to write our own creed, like mm -hmm. the Nicene Creed or whatever creed. They told us to write our own creed. At the same time, around that time, Breed Ain't No Future In Your Frontin' was Hilarious. out. And I took and rewrote Ain't No Future In Your Frontin' and renamed it Ain't, your, Ain't No Future In Your Creedin'. <laughs> and and took it and made the whole song about yeah. like man um oh man it made it all about like Jesus and and being with the um oh man hold up hold up hold up 
this song uh, what's that so, something the apostles gonna dance to get a band a second and a chance to hitting Jews with a scene on amazement while he's sitting back my sandals planted in the pavement <laughs> like um, I ride chariots uh, <laughs> I'm talking about um, if, they, <laughs> if they want to trip yo Matthew popped the trunk like I was on That's I was on some other stuff funny. like and I took that and rewrote it and I submitted that as and what what response did you get? I from got me? an F. <laughs> I, I got he said I got an F. I got an F. But I didn't care. I sat down the whole night rewriting this song, trying to make it about and it's whatever. It, mm-hmm. it did it did what it did. But that's funny. It didn't turn serious till I got to college level. Uh-huh. And like I said, I, I I went there for engineering. Rap wasn't on my mind. You know, I played what, around what, with it. And you're engineering now. What what form of engineering? Mechanical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and what what triggered that whole thought process? Like like so, people know one of my closest homies, Mike Will, uh, yeah. does jewelry design and stuff like that. But CAD and, and, and Chuck, like CAD programs in Detroit, and it makes sense because the big three yeah. is here, were abundant like in the '90s and a it little was. bit of the 2000s, like. You know, it, to the point where you would be, you know, you'd be graduating high school, you get like, you know, the handy down hoopty, and yeah. it'd be like somebody in the 10th grade, like, oh man, you just need a new conveyor belt. <laughs> so <laughs> so my, my father went to, um, he went to Wayne State University for drafting. Mm. Um, he stopped doing drafting and went to, um, a trade school for being a, becoming an electrician. Mm. But initially, he was in drafting. When I was in high school, I picked up uh, and tried and dabbled around with a couple of things. I tried basic programming, didn't like it. Uh, art classes, you know, it's whatever. But I got into drafting in high school. So that opened me up to that then. So when I got, by the time I got to Ferris, I was it was already ingrained in me, like, this, this is what I'm going to do. I'm following dope. suit. I'm following suit with what was the path and everything that was laid. He did it. He pulled it off. I could so pull it off like also. your brother, your dad. You had men in your life yeah. as like these are frames of reference right. of what success can now, be. Now, my brother turned me on to the music. Okay. He turned me on to the hip hop. We used to walk to the store, and he had the radio. We would go up there and pick I remember Ghetto Boy's first tape. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, I can tell in the cadence. I've always known that Scarface <laughs> right. was one. And what's so funny about Scarface is I had to get older to appreciate his music more because to me, and I love blues, like Scarface is like blues rap. Like it's it's not like it's not so surface level like a yeah. lot of other rappers. Like he has some, you know what I'm saying? Like, like the first minute pray, second to die. Like what, damn, what's what's know? funny is the first tape I actually own was Beastie Boys License to Hill. Uh-huh. Like I personally own Beastie Boys Life. And, that's it, that, and, then, and I, I love that album, but that's a great first fun, yes, energetic, yes, like everything hip hop, you know. Yeah. He had all the rest of it. So I didn't have mm-hmm. to worry about going to actually like purchase them. Mm-hmm. But I had that one. Then after that I had LL Cool J Bad. After that I had, you know, I would go and I dig through and stash some of his tapes and be listening to the to, to some of them. Ill Al Scratch, Grayson Jason, um, <laughs> Ill Al Scratch, uh, K Nine Posse when Charlie Murphy was was back spitting. Uh, Houdini, uh, KRS One. They used to call me KRS Two because oh, <laughs> because I kind of looked like it at the at the time or whatever chubby mm-hmm. little kid. So. It's, I picked up the music side from him. I picked up the professional and the drafting side from my father because my father was an electrician. So following suit and watching some of the stuff that he would do, I learned how to wire up a house. Wow. I learned how to plug in all this different audio equipment. He was an audio junkie. Laser disc, he had it when it first dropped. Um, Betamax tapes, he used to take it with big – my father was making bootleg tapes on beta and VHS, all kind of mm-hmm. other stuff. They came up with copy guards to put on it to keep people copying. <laughs> this man decided to go and find a box that descrambled what the copy guard was just so he can keep making it. T- so he, he was putting me up on that form of G, mm-hmm. the scientific electronic – you know, G like that. Whereas my brother showed me the hood and my mother showed me the creativity because she did crafts. She did design. She did, hmm. you know, a lot of stuff like that. She used to take our clothes and would paint characters and stuff on hmm. them. She used to do. So I've been surrounded by these type of, you know, 
creative these figures pillars and uh, that influence who you are. Exactly. So you get to Ferris, you know, you're in drafting. Yes. But hip hop. Here's here's how that here's how that more. here's how that connects because uh, there was two guys that was in the class. I wasn't the only black kid in that class. I was there mm-hmm. with my boy Kente. He's a principal of a school right now, and I ain't gonna put him up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got <laughs> um, you. Then I was I was uh, there with my boy Shum. He's out in Ipsy. He runs his own barbershop and everything mm-hmm. right now also. But those two leaving class, we were spitting. We was just spitting. Just, just mm-hmm. freestyling back and forth, whatever we came up with. And got better. And Kente was the dude that was, like, ill with it. He mm-hmm. was, I mean, he was sick. He was more on the poetic yeah. side of it. But my man's had lyrics out of nowhere that he can just pull out. And then it got to the to the point of, like, you know what? I'm having fun with this. This is a camaraderie that then we didn't build outside of just the school thing. These are my dogs because we connected mm-hmm. like that on this type of level. Uh, then it got to the point I'm like, you know what? I want to start making my own stuff. Got a hold of a computer. Uh, well, no, this is prior to that. My uncle, when I showed him the stuff I wrote, he plugged me in with my man's that had the studio. Mm-hmm. I got in there and I put out five. I, I would go and I would produce a song. Then the next week, I'll come back and record it. Hmm. Then I'll come back and produce another one. Then I'll come back and record it. Then I'll produce it. I'm doing the production. He jumped in and helped me on certain stuff. And I had other people I pulled in maybe to play some keys that I wasn't as good at. Now, but- wait. Let me let me tell you guys. It's difficult as hell. Difficult as hell. The first time I was in a studio. Yes. Warpath Records. It was Down River. Uh, shout out, first off, uh, rest in peace, Kokai. But uh, <laughs> Darius... Uh, Darius gave us access to a studio. It was down river. I had to pay my cousin to drive us over there. And when I first got there, they was like, you got to buy a beat. And I was like, I ain't got money to buy a beat. So I had to hook up with my homeboy, Karian. Yes. Karian knew how to make a track. Making a track was difficult. Yeah, it is. And when you've, you you know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't what it is today. Today, you got Fruity Loops. You got apps on your phone. You can just pull out something. You can you can select a loop and then add another loop. And then you can add a drum kick. And you may be able to be make a make make a beat in, like, 45 seconds. Back in the day, you would walk up on a beat machine where you had to program drums into the drum machine. Yes. And a keyboard that you usually had to program loops into it. If you had to sample, you needed a sampler that could take that those chops and now I'm gonna give you guys some nerdy stuff. <laughs> truncate what that sample would be. And all of this stuff's in your head, and you like, oh man, I just want this, I want this from this James Brown record. And the engineer would be like, Okay, that's cool. That's gonna probably cost you another Exactly. But see, me for me, I already had a bunch mm-hmm. of these sounds and everything in my head. Mm-hmm. And it's just to me, I can see pictures, but sometimes I have a hard time drawing them. Yeah. Same thing with these. Like, I, w- I came to him, and I'm like, okay, I want to make the beat. He's like, well, what, what do you want it to sound like? He put it on keys. I mm. went through, and I played the melody. Then went behind it. He showed me how to do the drum pattern on the keyboard. Um, showed me how to do the drum pattern. Showed me everything. And then the more and more I did that, the more and more, like, more sounds started hitting me. Lauren Hill's... Um, mm. Miss Girl, education. you know you better watch out. Yeah. Um, that thing, it was around the time that that came yeah. out. Um, but she had these stabs that was in a... No, 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 no. Uh, everything is dun, everything. Dun, dun, everything dun, is everything. Dun, 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 dun. She had those stabs that was in there. And I went mm. in there like, look, you know the Lauren Hill? I want to have the orchestra stabs just like that. Cue those up. And then, boom, I went and I played it. Dun. Dun, 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 and I went and laid the beat down. Mm-hmm. My man took it and ran with it, laid the rest of the drums. So it's, uh-huh. I would have so much stuff going on in my head. And, what, and, and I got to stop you right here for a tutorial for people. This is part of the camaraderie and the beauty of like brotherhood, fellowship, understanding, connecting, and then you're learning. And we're learning on the fly through creativity. A lot of things are being communicated because it, it, it's definitely like it should sound like uh, 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 uh. right. And then a producer has to know like, oh, uh, 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 uh. you want it to be like uh, 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 uh. Exactly. because if it's go uh, 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 the way you saying it, it's not going to be quantized. And if it's not quantized, it's going to be off a note. And then it's like, no, nah, I kind of want something that's not quantized. I'm getting into some real yeah, producer yeah. nerd <laughs> stuff here, right? and that's what makes Jay Dillon. And stuff I know so all unique. of it. That's <laughs> but we picked up all of this at like. 
16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, yes. where people were saying that rap ain't doing nothing. Exactly. You're picking up all this other but game. But see, at the same time, it's 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 teaching you a network. It's teaching you um, communication. It's teaching you teamwork. Yeah. It's teaching you so many different fundamental things. Like, mm -hmm. if I had not jumped into making music, I wouldn't have 90% of the stuff that I would have. Yeah, that's what i Right I'm now. Yeah. Like, because... What's funny is who I met through that was the plug to everything now. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Nobody from school, like uh -huh. Ferris le level, I haven't received no plugs from <laughs> Ferris level. So what did that give me outside of the papers? The the school level, I got some, the uh -huh. high school level, I got some plugs and everything from that. But music, mm -hmm. the attention that has come to me, mm -hmm. the attention that has come to, you know, the network that I built, like, the better and better I got once I left one group, then went off and went solo, then ended up meeting with another person that sang and ended up now in the band with this person. That person is the one that plugs me in with the first person, uh, plugs me in with a job. That job ends up plugging me in with another person that's the first one that actually gave me an engineering job, mm -hmm. gave me a career in that. Like, nobody else was giving me a shot. He's the first one that did that. That person. I sit there and I work through that. I develop the skills and regurgitating the stuff that I pull from school. And wait, time out. And we're going to talk brief. We spoke a little bit about this, but being a hip-hop engineer is definitely a craft of love. Yes, it is. Because as much as I love hip-hop and it's my favorite art form, dealing with rappers in the creation process can be sometimes the most exhausting. <laughs> Woo, man, dude! Exhausting if you, if process. we could, if I could, we would be here all night talking about the sessions that I have sat through. Like, bruh, like, all right, we gonna wrap this up. Some have been great. Yeah, you get some of them. When, yeah, when, you, when you in the, when you get a rapper that's in the zone, it's 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 phenomenal. Yes. But then when a rapper gets in a rut, and like we talked about it, they girlfriend there. Rappers, you know, it, and then this is the other thing. Uh, rappers still have the ego of rappers. So they got yes. their homies. They want to drink. They want to smoke. They yes. want to have a party. And then it's like, but we still got to get out what's going on. Yes. Um, just the, just it, it's just getting in that zone. But then when you get a rapper in the zone, and some rappers need all that extra stuff going on. Like I know Snoop likes sessions with a lot of people, you know, and, and it can it's like when you get a rapper in the zone, it's like, damn, that's yeah, that's something. He's on. Yeah. Because it, he's 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 relaxed. See, you have to you have to be you can't be tense in the middle of trying to make anything productive that you want to share and you expect other people to have fun with and be relaxed about. Um so having all these people around you, I understand. But at the same time it's business. And I try to be the guy that's in the engineer that's going to get you to appreciate the business as well as, you know, your craft. So if it's you on a song, you bring you. Mm -hmm. OK, if you bring somebody else, they sign papers to mm -hmm. say that they have nothing to do with this song that you're on. You that's know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just me and you putting a contract in front of a rapper. It's, it's me, like, yeah, it's, exactly. That's already, that's, and then that's already and some of them freeze like, "Oh, I gotta sign this to come in." Yep. yep. Oh no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, they you, gonna you be see like, what I'm saying? So it, exactly, <laughs> I used to tell a lot of people like, just bring who was on the track. One, I don't need that many people in my crib or mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. But, um, and that's I appreciated doing rock music also. Like I've I've been in you know rap. Yeah, I was gonna say I've been you've rock, done, I've, you've, you've gone across genre on a heavy level like people were looking at what i was doing like maybe 2006 2007 what i had with my band general population that one day we're gonna do something again I, right 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 days. banding is tough yes. but um but then and then i remember nadir that's back when we were in the 1440 he came down he was like you know this one this one guy that raps kind of like a bigger guy? His name's Volcano. I was like, yeah. He was like, he got a band that's kicking ass. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I didn't know he was rocking with Ben. Yes. And then it was like, oh, no. Nah, I'm like, if he's doing it, it's it, it used to get to the It used to get to the point. Actually, I remember one show we did, and it was a Halloween show. Me and Jim 
we're, you know, we're both lead. I rap, he's saying. We're sitting backstage the whole time getting face paint put on because for Halloween we were ICP, okay? We sat in the back waiting. And by the time it was time for when we went back there, nobody was there. By the time we came out, sea full of people. Wow. Like, all these people out here like, whoa, wait a minute. We did, We wasn't even expecting it. We walked yeah. out on stage like, whoa, wait a minute. Yes, exactly. But they all came to see us and hear us. Like, we didn't got in battle uh, bands and, and oh, yeah, you like, was, we was we was, was kicking. Was we killing. was legitimately was kicking, tearing up, mm -hmm. Mount, whooping Mount Clemens' ass. Um, and even got a chance to play, like, the State Theater and, and all kinds of yeah. stuff. It, it was, we was kicking. I appreciated that level because it was really thinking outside of the box with create creativity. We shot, we created a song called Salmon Shoes, and we recorded that song in Jim's house. We had the mixing set up in the basement. We had the drums all the way up on the second floor. We had the guitars in the bathroom on the first floor. We had the bass downstairs. We was had cables running all through the house, recording everything in one shot, That's and dope. it came out dope. <laughs> I mean, and it's that type of ingenuity and creativity. I mean, the trippy thing for me in the first gateway, why I led to saying like, damn, I think I want to start rapping with a band was it was it goes back to like, you know, you stop and all of that stuff. I did a show for um, I did a show for Black Star Community Bookstore mm -hmm. on Duele back when they used to do their open mics. And this may have been like, oh, five. Yeah, it was such a bad show. Because he was like, man, you rap, man, get up there and do it. I was forgetting my lyrics and stuff. I'm like, that's a horrible show. And he was like, it wasn't that bad. I was like, no, that was bad. <laughs> and I'm like, if that's going to be the last time I rap, I need to do something better. Give right. me another show. So I, I went back to the basics. So, like, my basics was I would rap in front of a mirror. I would remember all my rhymes. I would even try to mimic the moves of my hands, my motions, and stuff like that. Like, I wanted to know my pacing of where I would be in whatever the stage would be. So I had, that's why, like, when you walk in my house now, you see all these, the cheap mirrors all taped up next to the wall. So people thinking, like, like, why you, is it ego? It's like, nah, because this was the stomping grounds for me mm -hmm. rapping. Right. So I would practice my set. So I was like, let me get back to the basics of this. Let me practice my set and get good. Hence, like, the stuff Hostile J Kid and Mo Dirty used to tell me, get good. Right. Get good. So I was like, let me get good. I get good. It, went, it was maybe like six people in the audience. One of those six was Ron Rutherford from the Basics reggae band. Ron was like, you are so good, brother. You need to rap with me. And I was like, <laughs> all right. He was like, we didn't even pay you. I was like, for real? For real? I was like, yeah. I'm about to make I was like, money. yeah. So then we did, uh, <laughs> we did Arts, Beats, and Eats. It was a whole other cultural vibe. Yes. It was a huge crowd. It, it just felt different than the open mic scene. And I we even had like a backstage where it was food back there. They had drink. I was like, damn, this is... Like this is nothing like the rap experience. No, it's nothing. <laughs> it's 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 completely it's completely different, and it's it's man, it's funny. It's like I've I when I look back at like the realm of each one of these different realms that I've been yeah. in, you know, on a solo, on a rap group for years, mm -hmm. on you know from disasters on to volcano as a solo artist to volcano as Cody Stage Fright. From Volcano as Volcano and the New Radio Standard, Volcano as CEO of IE and T Records, Volcano as you know uh, owner of the Central Media, Volcano as Volcanic Engineering. It's like Volcano as Volcano Underground Radio. It's like each one of these things led to one the to the next, to the next, all with the intention of being able to feed each other. Because like I said it before, I. Uh, have never been the person to um, enjoy having to hunt other people down to do certain stuff for me. So I learned how to do it myself. I didn't want to have to hunt nobody else down to make my beat, so I learned how to make it myself. I didn't want to have to hunt anybody else down to do the engineering. I learned how to do it myself. Uh, you know, even the radio, the whole point of the radio show was like, I'm trying to get my stuff heard by these people and y'all playing and not playing my stuff. I'm going to make my own mm -hmm. and open up the doors and opportunities for everybody else to come through the doors also. And it's always been that. And I learned that in business, 
if you're doing it just for the money, then you're about to fail. If you're doing it for the sake of actually trying to create something and build something bigger and better than yourself and actually help other people, it's going to make it because you're actually doing what you're put here to do, which is cultivate, which is create, which is learn, which is grow, which is teach, which is spread, which is enjoy all the rest of these different networks that you can get into when you're doing that you're part of the universe that you're supposed to be in it ain't just about making bread bread is selfish yes make your money but still you know go ahead and do it for these reasons the group that i was a part of i did the production the engineering graphic work uh, even shot video, even so much different stuff that was put into it. All these skill sets that you apply right now. Exactly. And I, it got to a point to where I said, you know what? I know how to do all this stuff. Um, I'm about to make this into a company. <laughs> Why not? I might as well start getting paid for this stuff the way I'm supposed to be getting paid. I went and I learned the production. I went and I learned how to start doing certain stuff with business. I learned more and more about the things that I actually have and how to utilize them. And then you going back to the schooling of engineering, when I when each time I seen one thing start to fizzle, I pivoted. Excuse me. And the pivots were all for good reason. So now it's to the point to have volcanic engineering and it's all under the guise and, and to the point of, yes, I want to make money. Yes, I want to be able to service these clients and everything that have been coming to me because as I left from specific jobs, I built myself up as an engineer. Customers followed me to the different places that I went to. And it was like, where are you at now? Yeah. Oh, I'm over here. Can we get work through you? Let's see. I go through the the powers that be in a pecking order. Turns out they couldn't help them. Well, I'm tired of being in a position to where I can't help y'all because I'm somewhere else. I'll make my own, and that's what I did. When and, um, so volcanic engineering. What what uh, who are you servicing? What what are you offering? I offer well. I'm servicing um, automotive, aerospace, food, and music industries. Hmm. Um, my history as a designer has poised me to be able to design and create these things that can, um, for most of the work time I was doing was jigs and fixtures, automotive testing. I can hold a seat. I can hold a door. I can hold anything that goes into a car on this fixture and they test it before it goes into a vehicle. They break the hell out of it. They beat it up. They send it on sleds mm -hmm. with crash dummies. They do all this different stuff. They vibrate it till it falls apart. Everything. I create the, I create the basically the plug between the seat and their apparatus that's going to test it. I designed that and I build that. That's what I do professionally. But I do that for aerospace automotive. Uh, outside of that, I have people that are in the food industries. I've made parts and components for pierogi presses. I've made turbines to go into people's smokers. I've made, you know, other parts that's going to turn and churn meats or, or bread or whatever. I designed and actually built these things to go into their machines so their, uh, their stuff and their food and everything is still processed in the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I've made studio desks. I'm mm -hmm. in the process of di designing, you know, uh, DJ decks, um, speaker systems, drum systems, all these different things. So it, it it finds its way into each one of these different industries. Me being as a designer and also owning a machine shop, I can manufacture all these things. I can make it. I can I can I can get this metal part and say, hey, I want this to do this. Uh, I want these parts to attach here. I want these components and build up this whole full structure. That's either going to handle something in automotive, mm -hmm. handle something in aerospace, food or Right now, I'm even doing, like, trusses and lighting systems hmm. for DJ equipment. Yeah. So this way, if you go out, okay, you got this many pillars on it, you want it to be this way, I'll make it like this. Cool. However you want to. I can customize whatever I need. Mm, so nice. that came from, and I'm, I'm broadening it out even further because the economy the way it is right now, uh, with this Ukraine stuff going on, gas prices high as they are, uh, materials and everything going through the roof. 
maybe that the general um, automotive industry ain't flourishing the way it's supposed to be. They yeah. not pumping them out. But guess mm-hmm. what? Folks such as yourself, folks such as Joe Schmo over here, they got projects too. Yeah, they I got mean, prototype it's, ideas. It's, they it's want always. It's always stuff like that that that's functioning. Like I mean, we yes. we spoke a little bit about what's happening with how I feel about some of the podcast equipment. And yes, I don't think when it comes to community resources, like it's a it's a stopgap between what I think will function well versus what what we're available to now. Correct. So it's you, like almost like the creativity is moving faster than the technology. Right correct. Now. You could give me every last piece of equipment that you want rolled into one box and I can design that box that'll hold it and open up. You can take it and travel with it and open that whole thing up mm-hmm. and you have your whole full studio that you just carted around in this case. Yeah. It's possible. Mm-hmm. These things these things are there. Um and I'm seeing that, and I'm trying to to do that. I've I've taught uh, three people, actually four, on CAD systems. Two, one I know is at GM. Another one is at another higher up company doing design. A third, he's off with Rivian, and then the fourth, I don't know where he's at. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Um, I, that's a that's an off air story also, but right now I have a I have a younger kid who went to school for you know other forms of of engineering like uh, biomechanical biomedical or something of that nature wasn't really liking it came over he knows how to run a bridge port now which is a vertical milling machine cnc machining he knows how to run a lathe which is turning round parts he learned all these different things all within probably the round of six months mm. so the intention of this was to be able to teach us how to do this because i've seen in this multicultural environment that our culture ain't the ones that's always picking up yeah. on this. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? We're not always the ones that design it. We're not the ones that's machining, but we need to be. We got some very strong creativity and ingenuity. Yes. But sometimes like I guess the the barriers of entry in that world, like what you were saying, it took a while for you to get in the door. Exclude some of us from traveling in that space. Correctly. Correct. Um uh I'm telling her what the food is. Um, mm. We, it's. I don't think it's marketed to us the same way. No. If it wasn't, just like we spoke on the schooling, if it wasn't for the fact that me landing in that particular school, regardless of what my father went through when he was taught at the time frame, I probably wouldn't even seen that. I, I can't really speak of any other schools at that time frame that taught that or mm-hmm. people that was interested in that. I never heard any of my homeboys speak of that, you know, that realm of the yeah. world. Basic programming, what is that? Mm-hmm. Like, the funny thing is, I learned basic programming in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. The kindergarten teacher told us to write a basic program for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. you like, take this, if that, then this, that. You, you see what I'm saying? We had to write the whole program out. It was silly. But... um that form of learning, that form of teaching, that form of information probably wouldn't have been to me unless I had ended up in that form of schooling. And then seeing, like, the aftermath of it. These guys are chiropractors. They're doctors. They're business owners. One guy's like the, um, at one point, was like the head of of Chrysler before it became Fiat. Mm -hmm. Uh, One person was the head of, um, you know, all these larger, like, media uh, folks and and entertainers and uh, engineers and all these guys, every last one of them I seen that came from the class. There was no duds. There was no foul legs that came out of that class. Everybody moved on to make something of themselves in some way, shape, or form. That's something good to see, and I couldn't be lacking. I couldn't be one of the ones that didn't do that. So so I guess the next big question is, like, as you talk about aerospace and stuff like that, if I or somebody that I know is just like, hey, I just want some cool lights fixtures down here in this basement I finished and stuff, do we still come to you? Will we be in budget? Do you look at small projects, large projects? How, no, how so small, large, you know, one-off, multiples, whatever. I'm, you I'm take a, it on all capacities. I take it on all capacities because mm-hmm. I feel like everybody can be helped. 
I feel like everybody needs something in some way, shape, or form. Who am I to turn you away just because your project doesn't fall in line with what I typically $100, do? $100,000 or something. Exactly. <laughs> your your prototype, your your mm -hmm. light structure that you come up with, that's, mm -hmm. that will be correcting the issue that you may have. Say, like, okay, you yeah, have like these, these lights. The, the lights, he's looking at the LED lights that make a good background, but sometimes, like, the spacing, a lot of things can be, like, uh, what's that? Ergonomically, a, a lot of more or, order could happen in this exactly. podcast studio. So, so the way yeah. the way that you have them set, say, okay, we can make you a track that I actually yeah. fit those specific lights that will you know be able to still mount to the walls and do mm -hmm. this that and the other. But guess what? Not only did we create something that uh, fixes your solution, we just created a product. Yeah, that you can take and you can market and sell. Mm -hmm. Just like we talked about, and it's, here's it coming full circle. Just like we talked about back in the day when they came up with George Washington Carver creating yeah. this and that and the other, they were solving problems. Yeah. And those problem solvers became marketed mm -hmm. products. Yeah. So, hell no, I'm not going to turn away somebody that comes to me with some kind of idea. You know why? Because we can take and make something off of it. This worked out just well for yours. What would you like to do with it? Mm -hmm. Do you want to build it up? If not, Cool. So be it. I'm not gonna take you. I'm not gonna take you anybody's idea and run with it whatsoever. But mm -hmm. it feels good to know that we made something like this. Yeah. It feels good to know that we created something out of thin air, just like the music. Yeah. It's just deep. like writing a song. That's deep. So, so just the natural next question before we get to we wrap it now. How do people get in contact with you? Um. VolcanicEngineering.com. That is the website. You can go there. You can see past projects. You can see new projects and things that's coming up with news. You can also send over information to get a quote. Okay. Um, you can drop me files. You can drop me, you know, your information, contact information. Mm -hmm. I can go ahead and spit and just back like a quote. Like, uh, 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 uh. It's yeah. like, all right, I want a, uh, I want a propeller on top of my couch. Yes. <laughs> and see, I'm the type that I see. I, when I did it with my graphics companies, the Central mm -hmm. Media. I want. I made sure that I sat down with each person and say, what is it that you exactly want? Mm -hmm. Okay, what color schemes do you like? What's this? How long do you need it to be? I need all the technical information that you can possibly give me so this way I can take and make this product that you want exactly the way you want it. Mm -hmm. And also try to make it as cheap as I possibly can. Not cheap as in quality cheap, but more so cost effective to you for the material so that you're not yeah so so that it accomplishes this goal like correct you know, it's so many metals it's even different types of woods like, yeah i mean the next question i'm gonna ask you about when we wrap is we want to build a stage for uh the outdoor concert series okay so now we have some options on what we're thinking about and and, and how we're gonna go about it but it's different types of wood uh staging the ground ain't level it's a solution to the problem. Correct. It's just how do we go about solving that problem? Okay, so and, and I mean we'll we'll we'll, we'll we don't have to we don't have to go that yeah, deep, yeah, but yeah, yeah. we I, we can actually take and and solve that problem by design. I can run analysis and FEA to make sure it's going to withstand whatever you're actually doing, and we can take and manufacture and make it. Mm -hmm. I, I I open this up to to people to become a custom thing that not only helps people with the stuff that they want teaches kids to actually get into this field help myself by mm -hmm. being this you know business owner and growing the business to where it's supposed to be just so i can go ahead and do the things like giving back that's cool. you know that's that's the whole full circle each each thing i'm doing is fueling some other stuff i have a reputation as a musician which has fueled the reputation that i have i'm like some of my customers have bought my albums like literally like from Mexico and other international places. <laughs> like, yeah, what you rap, you make music, oh, I'll buy your album. Like, seriously, he's in Mexico bumping the stuff. Yeah. Just because he wanted to Works support. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what's up. So it's it's everything so, everything comes full circle in that aspect. So now your classic Detroit is different questions. I always ask people these questions. All right. So your very first car, year making <laughs> model, and what year did you get it? Whew. Uh, 82 Buick Skylark okay. was my first car. I got it from my grandfather. I got it in 1996. Ooh, that has uh, I almost got mm -hmm. voted for worst car. 
Hilarious. Because of that car. Somebody, before it got to me, somebody tried to steal it. But it was in the wintertime, mm-hmm. and the car didn't make it up the street. So instead of stealing anything else, they stole the steering wheel. So the Buick Skylark had a Pontiac steering wheel on it. <laughs> there was a hole in the gas tank. There was a hole in the power steering. The gas gauge did not work. So not only right. did the gas leak out, but you I also know. did not know, know where how at. much gas I had in it. Okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I could fill this thing up, and it would add a, uh, to a full tank. It would leak down to three quarters. I would drive it until it stalls, and I got to push it. Uh, All right. Wow. Worst car ever. But it was mine. The seats didn't recline. It didn't have a tape deck. (laughs) It just had a radio. So, yes, but it was it was mine. Did I drive it everywhere? No, I did not. I drove everybody else's car. My father had a uh, my grandfather had a uh, a New Yorker. If I went out on a date, I bother uh, borrow my grandfather's car. Yeah. Why? You gave me this piece of crap. You're gonna give me your car <laughs> to take out the ladies. All right. So uh, I don't know how they worked out that deal, but anyway, they I, I ended up with that car. That okay. was that was. Do you remember the first place you drove when you got it? School. Okay. Okay. I, t- I took it to school and I got clowned. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. It was it was one of those things where, in the winter time, I couldn't drive it. I couldn't mm-hmm. rely on it. It was mm-hmm. it was. I was supposed to be able to drive it back and forth to school. Mm-hmm. I drove it every now and again, but um, it literally like was a death trap. Like Funny. it was a rolling death trap. Um, I, I took it to school and back, and that was pretty much about it. I didn't. I probably took it out. No, the reason I kept talking about it is because if I started it, it had to run uh-huh. for like fifteen minutes. If it ran for fifteen minutes, yeah, for me to be able. That's why I got. That's why the steering wheel got stolen because they couldn't right. get yeah, it down yeah, the street. They could, yeah, yeah, they <laughs> didn't let it run. They no, didn't they didn't let it, it run. They could. Whoever stole it would have. They could. You can't hop in and just crank it up yeah, and pull yeah, off. There you, go. you crank it up. You got to. He got it next like, door. It was like <laughs> it, it was like a a a a, a, a self. It was a it was self-imposed low jack. Yes, <laughs> yes. It was the Flint. It was the Flintstone mobile for real. It was. So, it was. So, so so that that was the first car. My uh, my first car. Next uh, next classic question. Um, you're the DJ at the fireworks. Uh, Woodward and Jefferson. You spinning. What three songs you playing at the end of the fireworks? Whoo. That's an eyeball question. I've, what three songs am I playing at the end of the fireworks? Oh, as the like the grand finale. Yeah, it's over. Uh, yeah, yep. <sighs> Who? We are the champions. Okay, Queen. Uh What else am I playing? Oh, something, something heavy hitter. Something heavy hitter. No, I couldn't play that. That's my fight music. I couldn't play that. Um, we Are the Champions by Queen. That's something monumental. Um, play. What was it? It was just on the tip of my tongue. Um, give me give me Sammy Davis, Hello Detroit, just, okay. just to go ahead and, and, and give a little spin of that. And if I want to make it like big and 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 take it out um no nah, he ain't from here he ain't from here i don't know i might have to get back to you on that one i got so many different songs ringing off of my head and i don't know why like a ball and mjg uh you don't want drama is is it's sticking <laughs> off in my head but i know that's not a fireworks song but i love that song like that i just i just want to play that and just see people you. go be, i just want to see feel. people go nutty off you'll of off of that song okay yeah, yeah. I, that's the, that's my third pick whatever so you got you got that you got this and you got you know the classy Okay, last one. If you could rename Woodward after one Detroiter, who would it be and why? Ooh. Um, I have to name it after Coleman, but we got to Coleman A. Young. We got to, we got to. Coleman was so gangster. Mm-hmm. Like, Coleman was, was. 
he was a big he was a big influence and a big change for the city um he was a person that was feared mm-hmm. was loved he was hated he you know he he was a bunch of these different things he, he, he i'm sure he had some corrupt to him but he was the centerpiece of a lot of stuff that invite detroit and i always look at woodward as the direct center of the city so i probably would have to end up going with him all fair and he's the most named person also <laughs> yeah I, i'm 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 sure you know why because he's 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 recognizable he's he, he, like homegrown detroiter mm-hmm. he's he's probably the most recognizable if you know i could i could say adela i could say you know i don't want to say him not mm-hmm. that you know i had got anything against him but he, he ain't there yet you know what i'm saying his accolades are are great as a musician but mm-hmm. back in the city is he there yet you know what i mean uh it's hard to really it's hard to really take a a, a street as great as it is and not put a watershed person there and coleman was that watershed i agree i, I will say can't say kwame mm, <laughs> yeah I got Bing, you. whoever the mayor. Nah, yeah. that's it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's got, got it's got to be him. I got you. Great interview. Thank you so much. Check that out. And we definitely going to talk. Yeah. And uh, this was powerful. Thank yeah. you, man. Keep building. Keep building. Keep building. Yeah. Definitely going to keep doing it. Volcanic Engineering, the Central Media, uh, Volcano, and Volcano and the New Radio Standard will be coming back, as well as Volcano Underground Radio is going to be returning just as well. So, yeah. Keep plugging. I would be uh keep checking up with us. We're gonna have the open house and everything coming up as well. Bring your kids out and bring folks that are willing to, you know, see this in this shape or manner. To see an actual, you know, black owned engineering company, which you don't see around. I think we about the only ones. Yeah. Like seriously. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. All so right. bring them out. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Peace. Brother. Peace. Detroit is Different is where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is Different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today.